Thank you for inviting me. This is actually my first time here in Melbourne and what, for the past seven days? I've had a wonderful time. The weather has been lovely. We went to the Great Ocean Road. Road? Road? Yeah, road. It was lovely. And we, we had our own little sharing of the Dhamma. And to me, that has been really meaningful, to be able to sit together with friends and share Dhamma. And today, we are also among friends, with new friends. And I hope that this session will, you will find something useful to take away with you from this session. Okay, balance in the practice. How many of you here are meditators? I mean, do, you do your meditation, you attend talks, read the Dhamma, read the books, read the suttas. Do you read the suttas? Okay, and I assume that you want to incorporate the Dhamma in your daily life, yes? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to say anything really new. I hope not. I, I hope that this session would be something where I, I kind of help you to perhaps find, find, find that your practice has been on the right track and find meaning in the practice. That's what I hope to do for you today. Okay? Okay. Um, my first question. I usually start my talk with questions. So my first question for you, what is the Dhamma? And what is the purpose of Dhamma? Have a, any, any ideas? What is Dhamma? Because here we are, sitting here as students of the Buddha, disciples of the Buddha, and we are here to learn the Dhamma, right? We want to follow the Dhamma. What is it? Do you know? You can shout your answers from there. Sorry? Okay. Okay. It's a way of life. Okay. Some more? Sorry? Reality. Yes, reality. Any more? Nature. Nature, yes. I, what I'm trying to do is to have you go back to basic. We're here for the Dhamma, but what is the Dhamma? So, practice, daily life, nature, reality. What else? Sorry? Living in the now. Living in the now. Okay. Sort of. Yes. I would like to offer um, my perspective, which is three parts. One, the Ma, in my view, is the Buddha's description of reality. We have our version of reality. Our reality, our reality is shaped by our experiences, our biases, our assumptions, our upbringing, our culture, and so on and so forth. We, that, all, all that had formed a part of us today, that's your baseline. And that, to you, is your reality. The Ma, Buddha's the Ma, is the Buddha's explanation of reality, the Buddha's reality. So in the Buddha's reality, it is a little different. In fact, it's no, 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 not a little, it's quite different from the regular person's perception of reality. If it were the same, we, wouldn't be, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have so much dukkha. Dukkha has been translated as suffering. If our reality is identical to the Buddha's reality, we shouldn't have dukkha. But that's not. The fact that we have experience of agitation, frustration, stress, unhappiness, the fact that we have all these experiences means 
our reality is what is now called conventional reality. It's our sense of what's real. And that's very different from what is really real. So Dhamma, contained in Dhamma, is the Buddha's description of reality, ultimate reality. This is one. Two, Dhamma is also a formula for practice. It's a methodology of what we have to do to reshape the way the mind thinks and feels about things. And from, as a result of your effort to reshape behavior and recondition the mind, only then will you really see the reality, the ultimate reality, as the Buddha had described. So the second thing about the Ma is it's a formula of practice. It's a methodology of practice. Okay? It's like what we call the IKEA steps to fixing a cupboard. So this one is fixing our mind, repairing it, changing it. Third, if you follow the method, now the methodology, judiciously, in a very disciplined way, very patiently, very thoroughly, you will reshape the way your mind works. You will then see the reality as he had taught. When that happened, your mind will settle into an equilibrium. You will live in the now you will experience Nibbana, the Dhamma. So Dhamma is also a description of what happens at the end of your own practice. Okay? Three, to me, Dhamma is a description of reality as the Buddha, sorry, the ultimate reality. It's a methodology of practice and it, and it is, and it is nature as is. What you will experience at the end of your practice, that is also Dhamma, explaining the Dhamma. Three parts. So what then is the purpose of Dhamma? What do you think is the purpose of Dhamma? Essentially, to fix, to repair the mind. Our regular mind, because our regular mind has experiences of dukkha, our regular mind is not healthy. It's not always healthy. You may think that your, your mind is, oh, I'm okay, I, I, I'm, I'm fine, I'm okay. Then I shall ask you this question, and you answer honestly. Maybe not to me, you can answer to yourself, but I ask you this question. Do you believe that life can be better? Do you believe that? How many of you would say life can be better? How many of you say, let's hope life is not worse? <laughs> oh, that's good, that's good. <laughs> How many of you say, oh no, it's okay, life like this is fine? How many of you say that? Great, because if you say that, then you're fine. But you can see that most of us think that life can be better. The fact that you say life can be better means right now, it is not perfect. It is not as you wish it to be. It could be better. It is not in daily pain. It's not, you're not, you know, it's not excruciating. You don't drag yourself out of bed every morning, but life can be better. You think about it, if you say life can be better, it means you need the Dhamma <laughs> to make it better. Okay? So let's start. I thought it would be uh, useful to explore 
for us here to just explore the nature of the regular mind. Rather than call it a normal mind, which implies that our mind is not normal. I mean, mind is very normal. But let's just call it the average, regular mind. Huh? I said, the problems of the regular mind is, or are, one, deluded. What sense of reality? Well, it's not as dire as the sound, but if you think about it, you think about it. Your reality and my reality and everyone else's reality is not identical, is it? Is it? It's not, right? Then whose is real? <laughs> I like you. <laughs> if hers is real, isn't it that all of ours is war? But see, she's deluded into believing that hers is real <laughs> because mine is real too. The fact is, we have subjective reality. We believe. We believe. I mean, what you see, hear, taste, touch, etc. And what you think about and what you think, you assume, your start point is you assume that's real. But that's only one slice of reality. And from a scientist's perspective, you look at that and you say, it's just your reality. It's, it's not real, but we believe it to be completely real. You see what I'm saying? It's a little bit. And, and that's a good day. On a bad day, it would be even less accurate. And what do you know about accurate? We don't really know. We just believe it to be real. So this thing about deluded, it's Buddha's own words. He said, moha. Moha, the regular mind is trapped in loba, dosa, moha. What is loba? Greed. What is dosa? Anger. What is moha? Delusion. So, I'm not the one saying that you are deluded. It's part of this teaching. We don't really have a complete sense of what is really real. We have only a subjective perspective. And that's as good as incomplete. Therefore, moha, a bit deluded, okay? Addicted to pleasure. You think about it, correct? We would much prefer pleasure than pain, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct? And if we can measure pleasure, we will pick the one that gave us the most pleasure. And our mind will register the memory of it, the mind will register the experience, and then, at odd times, it will play back again and again and again. So we can get to experience the pleasure again and again. I say addicted because how many of us could just walk away? How many, how many of us can just walk away from, you know something is fun. You know something brings you delight. Walk away from it. Oh, why? It's not hurting anybody. So why should I walk away? Never mind, just one more bite. You see what I'm saying? And the harder it is to walk away, the more you're addicted. That's all. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. The only problem is this addiction, whether you like it or not, is painful. And it will be. As long as you find something pleasurable and you constantly need to go back to that, to revisit it, it is painful. You will know when someone you love dies. That's when the pain really hits home. Because there is no way you can revisit the relationship. It's over. But the mind will play back. 
and then the, body, the, the mind will yearn. And that's just the way it is. So the regular mind has this problem. How severe it is depends on the individual. We have our own ways of coping with this addiction. Some of us just stop thinking about something. Some of us will just, never mind, be the moth, go back to the flame again and again. Burnt again and again, it's okay. Some of us are really creative. We just let the next guy in the next life handle. This life, we stay, we stay addicted. It's not a problem in the next life. <laughs> okay. Ah, perverted motivations. I am not saying, I'm not accusing you of being perverted. But let me ask you this. When was the last time you had a quarrel with someone? When? Okay, don't tell me, don't tell me. But you recall that incident, and do you recall how your mind refuses to give up, to let go of the anger? Do you remember that? Of course you do. If that's not perversion, what is? This is the person you love the most, isn't it? Oh, okay, I assume that you quarrel with someone you love. Assuming that you, this is someone you love very much, and this person who, whom you love very much, you got really annoyed. But you couldn't let go of the anger. Why? By the way, you're not the only one. All of us in this room, or rather most of us in this room, will have a problem trying to break free from anger. I call that habit and motivations. Essentially, they're two. You can have all the breakdowns from there, but essentially they're two. There is loba, greed, and there is dosa, anger. And every other akusala, unwholesome, every other unwholesome emotions, feelings, stem from these two. You name everyone and I'll tell you how they are linked to these two. For instance, doubt. Doubt. What has doubt got to do with Loba and dosa, greed and anger. Doubt is linked intimately to loba, greed. You want to know the answer. You want to know what's right or wrong. You want to have this uncertainty clarified, sorted out. That you want a proper answer makes it want. Greed is not the licking the ice cream greed eating something greed, but it is a form of wanting. And you name anything, agitation, for instance, huh? a bit fidgety and a bit anxious, worry. What's worry? You want an outcome, you want a particular outcome, and you're afraid the outcome wouldn't be as you wish. And so you worry. There is another form of wanting. You want to give me another one? Fear. Fear is you wanting to feel all right, that you're, you are safe, that what you hope for will happen and not the opposite of it. So fear is also wanting. And you look at fear and you look at worry and you look at every one of them, it has the wanting and it has the aversion. It is not pleasant. The sensations are not pleasant, right? The feeling of fear and agitation, they're not pleasant. They're painful. So there will be some degree of dosa, ill will, anger. And yet, on a regular day, you look at your own minds. How often do these unwholesome sensations pop up? And they will fade away, but they will pop up, pop, 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 again and again. Why so? The mind has a habit of keep going to something it likes, it wants, it seeks. So these are habits, and they are not good habits. 
See that? Habits. Motivations. Why motivations? Very often when you start to do something, you look at your own intention. Is there greed in it? Is there wanting in it? Or is it the opposite that's there? You look at your mind and you see any of this, you know. All habits, all motivations are back. And they're hard to break. Okay? Toggling between the two extremes, you chase, or then you, tell, you chase for something that you want, or then you tell yourself, I will deny myself of that. Either I have it, or I will say, because, because looking for something, chasing something is low bar. Let's not have low bar. Let, can I use Pali words? You are comfortable with it. Okay. Well, let's not have low bar, you say. So, I will not have it. Then now you have a different type of low bar. It's called low bar of not having. The greed is, I will not give in. There is a wanting, but I don't want to give in to my wanting, so I want not to give in. And you will toggle between. And as long as the mind has all these features, as long as the mind leans towards these habits, you will experience dukkha. Dukkha, as I'm not sure I've explained it, dukkha traditionally translated as suffering, right? And that's because they couldn't find a proper word for dukkha to replace dukkha. Oh, completely, absolutely, they can't find that direct translation. So you will find the possible, the, the possible translations are dissatisfaction, uh, unsatisfactoriness, which is really many syllables, or suffering, unhappiness. Dukkha merely means a spectrum of unpleasant sensations, a spectrum. So you can be mildly annoyed and you are experiencing dukkha, or you could be in excruciating pain, and that's the regular suffering. Okay? I don't always find. But as long as you do not feel great, good, happy, you are in dukkha. Okay? So what's the crux of the practice? In this, in the Eightfold Path, in the practice, the Buddha's method of training the mind and reshaping the mind, the intent is to eradicate ignorance, is to mop away, clean up, cost you to see the nature of the mind and reality as is. The Pali word is yatha buddha jnana dasana. Yatha buddha, whatever is there, whatever is. Jnana dasana, see and understand. Jnana is knowledge, dasana is see. See with knowledge and understanding whatever is as is. So without our subjective input, without our regular habits and motivations coming into picture, trying to frame the mind into a context that it understands, without that interruption, Seeing the mind and whatever is, is happening in the mind as is. If you succeed in understanding the nature of the mind, then you are successful in abandoning ignorance. If you cannot objectively observe 
the, the processing, the processes of the mind, then ignorance, you still have ignorance. It still holds you in its grip. Okay? In order to be able to do this, to see the way the mind works as how it works, in order to be able to achieve that, you need to develop, hence the quiet mind, the, med, the samadhi and the sati, mindfulness and concentration and so on. You need that to help the mind get very objective, very detached, very clear, and because it is very detached, it is clear when there is an arising or not, whether it is subjective talking or not, or it's just very objective observing. Hence, the Buddha used the words clear awareness with mindfulness. Clear awareness, full knowledge with mindfulness. The practice requires you to train the mind to a state where the mind is very objective, very calm, quiet, observant, with some clarity. I will explain further later in this talk. So we are training to overcome habits of the mind so that you can let go, abandon, our wrong views, our assumptions. I call it ignorance. Second, if you practice, you dutifully put into, uh, in, weave the Eightfold Path into your daily life, the second objective will, the, the second thing will happen, which is that you will start to let go of bad habits, unwholesome mental habits. I call it overcoming craving. It will happen. If you try, if you try at this point without training and understanding, if you try now to stop craving, then what you have introduced into the process is craving, spiritual craving. Which is why when you go for retreat and you do your meditation without the proper understanding and training, you will end up having more dukkha, elevated dukkha, but dukkha nonetheless. And third is for the realization of Nibbana, the mental state that the Buddha said should be the goal of all Buddhists. Okay? In order for your mind to be able to see how it works, to penetrate your, our regular habits and to realize that, oh, this is how, this is what the nature of the mind is. In order for the mind to be able to do that, you need to cultivate these five mental conditions. Sadda, faith, sila, which has been translated as morality, but you are a practitioner. It should not just be about morality, it should be about virtues. Mindfulness, samadhi, it's been called concentration, but when I explain later, you'll, I couldn't find a proper English word for it. It's been used as, the word has been meditation, concentration. I, I just use the word focus, but I will explain to you why later. And wisdom. The intent of developing these, cultivating these five mental states is to literally change a lifetime of software programming in your mind. We are like organic robots. We have very strong habits. And we need to ch change that. We are rewriting the operating system. In case you're wondering if I just pluck these five mental states off the air, no. They are from the 37 factors of enlightenment. 
And if you go through the 37 factors of enlightenment, you will find that in all of them, these five mental states will appear. Either specifically, explicitly, or implied. It's there, the five. And I will next explain what are these five and why they are so important. When I talk about balance in the practice, it's balancing these five mental states. Are you familiar with them? No? Yes? Yes? No? Maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> mm, I think so. <laughs> you know, knowing the words, it's not the difficult part. Understanding what they mean is not the difficult part. The difficult part is operationalizing them. Really waking them up. Waking these five mental states up in your mind. And by the way, they are sequential. You have to start with sadha. If you think that meditation is going to solve all your problems and rest, uh, well, it's good to have. No. No, they are not. You don't have them in sequence. You don't have them compressed. You don't have them arising at the same time in your mind. Meditation is a temporary relief. It's only temporary. Fundamentally, the mind hasn't really changed. And you will have a relapse. If you're having a lot of pain, you can have painful relapse. Okay? Sadda. You know, I really got to get you guys answering questions. <laughs> you don't mind if I use Pali words, right? Because I like Pali words better. But I can't give the talk in Pali. It's mainly in English. So occasionally, I shall indulge in the Pali words. Sadda. You see, I, I, I use the word faith, but an American friend told me, Sylvia, can you stop using the word faith? Use the word confidence. Because faith has the wrong connotation in my culture. Sorry. In my culture, it has no wrong connotation. In my culture, faith is a good thing, you know. The idea here is really confidence. But confidence to the degree so strong that even when you don't know, you will just give it a good shot. Now, first, it's Traditionally be said, and you will see this in the, in the suttas, faith is faith in the triple gems, Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Agree? You all, you, all, you, all have all, you all have faith? Really? I mean, yes. <laughs> then what is the Buddha, what is the Dhamma, and what is Sangha? What is Buddha? The teacher, right? What is Dhamma? His teaching. What is Sangha? The monks. You are telling me nouns. These are nouns. They're not good enough. How do they speak to you? The Buddha, if you say, I have faith in Buddha, what you mean must be, I believe he was enlightened. I believe whatever that he taught, achieved the results he said they would. I believe he walked the talk. He was perfect in terms of wisdom, in terms of conduct. You understand? You do not believe in the statue. You believe in what Buddha stood for. What did he stand for? There is a way out of your current mental state. If you never saw the Buddha in this way, 
that's the reason why the faith didn't explode. You have to see the Buddha not as a person, but what he was able to achieve and believe that what he was able to achieve was what we can also. Which is why in other traditions, they talk about the seed of the Buddha. Is that, is that what they call? Buddha seed? Buddha, Buddha seed? Something like that. Actually, the idea here is qualities of the Buddha. You recite in Pali, Iti Piso Bhagawa Arahan Sama Sambuddha. Yes? Mm, yes? <laughs> yes. What were they? They were his qualities. They were who he was. And if you believe in the Buddha, those qualities are the qualities that must be part of you. Oh, but I'm not Buddha. I didn't say you were. I merely say you can inherit the qualities, the knower, the understanding the being awakened in the moment, the no dukkha in life, all these were his gift to us. The inheritance that he gave his son was the Dhamma. He gave the, the person that he had the deepest love for, he gave the Dhamma. And that's what we have for him, from him, the Dhamma. Having faith in Dhamma means what? The belief that the teaching can deliver results as he had promised. If you don't believe that the Dhamma works, then what's the point of saying, of being a Buddhist? If you cannot use his method to help you live a joyous life, then what's the point? of being Buddhist? Is it merely an identity? I'm a Buddhist. Batch. Is that what it means? It cannot be. It must be the essence of the Dhamma. That is why, have you heard of this phrase? Huh? When you see the Buddha, you see the Dhamma. Have you heard of this phrase? Okay, there is this phrase. <laughs> and the phrase goes, if you see the Buddha, you will see the Dhamma. Okay? Trust me, there is this phrase. And this is not one of those that they concord and then they put online and everyone is very happy about it. It's not. It's a real phrase. Buddha actually said, when you see the Dhamma, when you see the Buddha, you see the Dhamma. When you see the Dhamma, you see the Buddha. When you begin to internalize the practice and you begin to see reality as he saw it, that is when you are seeing the Dhamma. And that is when you know what Buddha was. You understand? So having faith in the Dhamma is believing that the teaching he left behind will help you to be happy, to free, to be free from Dukkha. That's what it means. And what is Sangha? Now this one you answer. What is Sangha? I won't tease you guys. I'm looking that way. <laughs> what is Sangha? Monastic community. Yes. But why? <coughs> sorry, sorry? Yes, yes. I like this version better. <laughs> yes. You see, he is right. It is the monastic community. Ah, but there is more to that. Is the monastic community not necessarily just in robes? It is the embodiment of the practice, the Dhamma, and a living, a living embodiment of what it is at the end of this journey. In other words, there are practitioners who have walked this path the Dhamma path to the logical conclusion and realized what the teaching was all about. 
as they are practicing, so the monastic community, they're practicing, right? As they are practicing, the rest of us gets inspired. Yes, this is what it means to practice. Yes, this is what it means to finish the practice. Both ways. The actual effort and the successful beer at the end of a day's hard work. Okay, they're not supposed to drink beer. The tea. The tea with milk or sugar. That's fine. Take it as you like. But it's the, the joy. The joy of living the Dhamma. So monastic, sorry, Sangha are the group of people. The word Sangha actually means gathering, I think. Gathering? Group? Community. Community of practitioners who systematically incorporate the practice, the structure of practice into their daily life and they live happily, joyously with a mind that is not caught in the grip of dukkha. They are happy that way. And no, because this is, uh, is self-effort, you have to do it. Because only you can reach in and fix what's in there. I can't fix it for you. Buddha couldn't fix it for the... If he could, he would have... And then, we're, we're fine. But he, it cannot be done. Only you can go in and do your tinkering in there. That is why it's called practice. You've got to reshape the neural pathways yourself. Okay? I am only at one. Okay. Anyhow, when you reflect on Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, you have to reflect with correct understanding. If you don't believe, you look at the, the Pali chanting, right? I told you earlier, the first one that says qualities of the Buddha, nine qualities of the Buddha. The one that talks about the Dhamma, Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditi, you know that one, right? You know it in English. See for yourself. Timeless. The moment it takes in effect, it's there. You know it. You sense it straight away. And the same method works for anyone over time and space. Doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, what race, which centuries, 2,500 years old, the doctors today will tell you it can work. Right? <laughs> the Dhamma in the Chan tells you that you have to do it for yourself, but when you walk it properly, you can feel the effects immediately. It is an experience for you to see for yourself. And when you feel it, when you see it, it makes you want to continue this journey. The moment you start to have a sense of what it is, you want to continue this journey. But you have to choose. You have to come and see it for yourself. And so on. And then on on Sangha, it talks about practicing well, practicing correctly, practicing with understanding, and experiencing it completely and properly. So it is about someone who managed to transform his mind, about a method that works and helps others to do it for themselves, and there are individuals through the centuries up to today who are still applying this ancient technique and fixing, restoring for themselves mental health. That's all. And what is required of us is to have that faith that it can work. I said it is powerful, essential, uplifting. You see, you're going to change a lifetime of habits. And if you're Buddhist and you believe in rebirths, 
You got to change lifetimes of habits. It's hard. So there will be days when you will self-flagellate. I am such an awful guy. I just snap at somebody. What kind of a practitioner am I? And there you are, you know, just going round and round. The me, mine, and I am so bad. I could do better than this, and so on. Worse, you could be looking at somebody and go, "You so bad. What kind of a practitioner are you?" Blah 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 blah. blah. We do that. If you have faith, this is when you take a deep breath for yourself. Huh? You take a deep breath, and you say, "It's all right." Buddha said Deva Datta will come back from hell and be human and become a Pachika Buddha. Anybody can do it. It's all right. I will keep going. But Deva Datta, if you don't know Deva Datta, you check chapter 16, I think. It's there in my book. Entire story of Deva Datta. It's awful, awful, scary man. But it's all right. He will be back as a Pachika Buddha. <laughs> he, he, because of his practice and all, he'll be fine. You can't be worse than the old doctor, right? I mean, none of us is. I like to tease my, my students and say, you can't be worse than Angulimala. Anybody knows Angulimala? Yeah, he's a more prolific killer than Jack the Ripper. And he became an Arahan. So he can do it. It's okay. We will, we will make our way there slowly. We, we, we will try. Okay? So having faith, having faith is having a mental state of confidence and this mental states of confidence is what will anchor you on this practice and keep you going when the going is tough one two this is this is what is imp important i really have to, i can't really see it's important and i can't see ah okay it's important because Buddha said, in the, in the manner that we learn the Dhamma, you have to listen. He says, uh, you come, you sit, you listen with open ears. You remember, you put it into, you start to compare what you have heard about the Dhamma, and you start to compare that to your experience. And if you find that there's some correlation, this is when you will be inspired to practice, right? This is, this is what it said in the Sutta. What does this mean? It means that true faith, real solid faith, actually depends, requires you. First and foremost, it changes, it morphs, it's not static. It's not I start with deep faith and I continue with deep faith and I will die with deep faith. It is not like that. Faith morphs. It's a mental energy. It's a mental state. And in this mental state, it will change. It change according to conditions. So, the Buddhist, the Buddhist faith requires some amount of understanding, knowledge. It is faith that sits on wisdom. I will talk more about this later. But when I use the word multifaceted purposes, one of which is faith will help you to learn. Faith will keep your ears open to the Dhamma. Faith will make you want to, even when you are very tired, pull out a book, a sutta, and go, I will read the next one. Because today, I need my contact with the Dhamma. It is faith that keeps you going when, when your preference is, let's have a cup of coffee before the TV. Or let's just go out and chit-chat with friends. Faith keeps you anchored on the practice. So faith is very important. If you have questionable faith, meaning to say, oh, I believe in the statue, and I believe in his teaching, and I believe in the monks, and that's it. That's very thin. That's not what will keep you anchored in the Dhamma. If that's all you have, that's the reason why you didn't practice. Because all you have is just sample faith. You know sample? You go to the beauty, you, know, you pass by the perfume place and they give you a sample. This is a little thing and you, that, that's it. Draw. Sample. So faith is required 
for you to want to know more, to want to see how it really works. And then when, it, it, when you start to practice and you're on track, you will realize that, hey, there's something really good here. I'm feeling different. And that is faith increasing. And that will get you to go even further. Ah, okay. Two more points. Faith will also, if you are a practitioner, what will happen is you will dutifully do what he said. He gave like eight points. You will make sure that you understand what is required in the practice and you will dutifully do the eight points. If he says six points, you will understand what that six points means and you will do exactly like, for instance, uh, eightfold path is eight parts, right? Eightfold path is how many parts? <laughs> <laughs> I was just checking temperature, just making sure everyone is awake. Eight parts. And it is in sequence. I mean, I've, I've known of people who say, oh, it doesn't matter, you can jumble it. It's in sequence. Why do you think he said it in sequence? For you to just switch it around? And a puzzle piece, if, if it's an eight part, eight piece puzzle, they have to be fitted correctly. You fit it all over the place and how is that supposed to bring out the picture? It won't work. In the same way, the eightfold path has always been listed in that sequence. That sequence is important. Following the sequence is transformative. Doing it DIY any or how you will not see the table. You're going to fix the table, you know, IKEA. IKEA. When you want to fix that table, you do it whatever way. I feel like putting the screw here. We'll just see what comes out of that. Okay? It's not as he had asked you to. Ah, okay. Dynamic faith can be cultivated. And this is the one I want to emphasize for your society. You have to find for yourself good Dhamma friends. Kalyana Mitta, good Dhamma friends. It helps a lot. Ananda once had a conversation with the Buddha. Ananda loves to talk to the Buddha. So many of our suttas came from Ananda. Ananda said, Bante, friendship, Kalyana Mita, good friend, is half the holy life. What was Buddha's response? Oh no, Ananda, it's the whole of the holy life. Friendship, Kalyana Mita, is important. Of course, the important word here is not mitta, the important word is kalyana, wholesome, beneficial, good friends. If you have a kalyana mitta, that's not very useful. That's when you go rhinoceros horn, walk alone. Find a good dhamma friend. In this community, they must be here. I'm, I'm guessing that in this community, you're all here. So make friends with each other, okay? Why is that important? Because there will be days when you doubt. There will be days when you are disappointed, when you're feeling down, when your emotions swing the other way. Then you will need your friends to keep you on track. No, 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 that's the direction. That's the direction. Don't detour. Keep you on track. You need good teachers. You have monastics who come here. Come, sit, listen, pay attention, remember, compare, correlate, learn. But, but we live in a great world. A great world because you don't even have to be physical presence. You can go online and look for all the great teachers. And you can read. We have the entire spectrum of Dhamma books and so on. So this, I call these the live teaching. 
friends, teachers, even texts online and so on. They are alive. You'll be surprised. It's sometimes important for individuals, not for everyone, but there's some individuals who need a connection, like a shrine. It's important for them. So be it. Whatever it takes that helps you to bring up the faith, do it. If you need some ritual, like a lamb, flowers, water, whatever, you can go ahead. This is fine. Ritual is fine. As long as you understand it is not the ritual that cleanses your mind, this little act is just to help you anchor the mind on faith. That's all. Okay? So if you choose a Buddha Rupa, an object, find one that you like because they're not all made the same. Okay? Um, what else I want to say? Ah, I've written an uh, e-book on faith. It's online. It, it hasn't come out in uh, hard copy yet. It, it should by next year, but it hasn't come out in hard copy. It's online uh, in e-book form. We will give you the, the link. Okay? Have you all read it? No? Oh my, really? Sila. Okay. Um, am I correct to say that Sila has always been rather underrated? I, I, I kind of put it there. I, I will put it this way. Let me, let me just say it this way. Some people believe that to realize the Dhamma, all it takes is wisdom. So we should understand. We should build understanding. Some people believe that to really see the Dhamma, all you need is meditation. So they, 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 there's a huge emphasis on the meditation, less emphasis on, on sila. And part of the reason why I say it's underrated is because you, you have schools that teach the mind, you have schools that teach meditation, but there's no school that emphasizes sila, is there? And usually when you learn from someone, it's, it's often, in fact, it's partly our fault. You hear the word, today's talk is on sila, attendance goes down. Today's talk is on meditation, attendance goes up. Yeah? Fair? Oh, stow it, huh? <laughs> so I'm guessing that therefore sila is something, it's, it's, the, it's the quality that's not heavily emphasized. I want to say this. Sila is hugely important. Hugely important. We... Now, sila... You understand it to be morality, which is avoid doing evil, do good, purify mind, right? It's something like this. So avoiding evil means do not, um, do not break the five precepts. And then on a really good day when you're observing your eight precepts, do not break the eight precepts. So you have in mind a list of don'ts. Don't do evil. The don'ts are the precepts. And then what are the do's? Oh, uh, the 10 meritorious deeds. Have you heard of the 10 meritorious deeds? Uh, do, have you heard of the 10 meritorious deeds? Read my next book. It's called Sila. It is out already. We'll give you both links. Sila is not just about action. It is really about the mind. And for this group, I will cut it down to just this. Anything unwholesome, meaning you, you experience loba, dosa, moha is always there. You experience loba, greed, dosa, anger. As long as those mental states arise, you have akusala, unwholesome. 
any mind that regularly indulges in a kusala, you are asking for trouble because the mind will develop a habit and then that habit becomes your default mental state. If you say, oh really? I never noticed. Ask the person next to you. If you are angry, often, at some point, it even becomes a permanent or semi-permanent feature on your face, let alone the mind. Do you notice that? Have you looked into the mirror and go, I'm looking more and more angst. Now, it means you have been angsting for a while. And you look at somebody and says, oh, she looks worried. And after a while, oh, she is worrier. Something like this. It's really, the mental states can shape your daily experience. So if you're an angry person, after a while, anger is your default baseline. You're in trouble. You're going to just feel very upset over little things. So putting, why does it happen? It shouldn't happen like this. And conversely, if you are generally quite peaceful and happy, after a while, that becomes your default mental state. And even when things don't go your way, you're fine. So here I say they are critical for happiness and spiritual progress. I just explained that they are critical for happiness, right? If you want to be happy, don't be angry. Try not to be angry all the time. Try to eradicate anger. At some point, you'll be fine. When you, that, that, then you'll be fine. You'll be happy. Somebody, you know, some of you might say, oh, so easy. Yes, it is. Have more faith. Okay? And then I say, morality is critical for spiritual progress. That is where the meditation comes in. Eightfold path, Paniya, wisdom, Sila, virtues, Samadhi, that quiet mind. Three parts, right? What comes before Samadhi? Sila. Without, without a pleasant, gentle, happy, peaceful mind, Samadhi is very difficult, if not impossible. Possible. So some of you will say, yeah, when I go into the retreat, I spend like three days and I feel really good and then I can meditate. But when I come out of retreat, I'm not sure why, but I can't meditate anymore. I know why. Because in a retreat, you made, very, you made sure, you were very careful to keep your mind sila. I mean, what is the teacher going to say when you snap, snap, snap at your friends? So you try to be very nice, very gentle, and after a while, your mind settles into a gentle, happy state. So the meditation comes. The quiet mind happens. But out of the retreat, voila, back to normal life. And you tell yourself, it's perfectly normal to revert to old behavior. Then your retreat is over. Your efforts are over. You've lost it. You have lost Sila. And because you have lost Sila, Samadhi joins him. They are best friends. There was a sutta where Ananda had a conversation. Uh, Ananda, tonight I'm going to hear a lot of Ananda. Ananda had a conversation with the Buddha. And in this conversation, Ananda asked the Buddha, Why, Bhante, must we have Sila? And Bhante said, uh, Buddha said, so that you are free from remorse, conscience clear. Why, Bhante, must we have a, free, a, a clear conscience, free from remorse? Bhante said, so that you have piti. Piti is rapture, joy, joyous. And then he went on, Bhante went on, you have sukha, you have uh, all kinds of delightful pleasant, happy experiences. And then Ananda said, why do we need all these happy, happy experiences? Where are all these? They all came from Sila. 
So why do we need all this joy and happiness? Why, why do we need this? Bhante said, so that we can have samadhi. Ananda say, why do we need samadhi? Buddha said, so that we can experience yatha buddha jnana dasana so that the mind is able to see as is see and understand or understand and see as is buddha said that morality keeps your conscience free makes you happy makes you light your mind can go still because the mind has gone still you can see how the mind works. See that? A sequence. Who are we to tell the Buddha, no need, no need, no need, no need, samadhi, good enough. Who are we to tell the Buddha that we can, we are modern men, Bhante. We are modern men. We are better. We don't need the sila and the Pasadi and all these wonderful Pali words. We don't need them. We just focus on Samadhi. And then we can Yata Buddha all we want. It doesn't work like this. He was the real doctor of the mind. We were supposed to follow his instruction and then try and get to the destination as he said it would happen. You understand? So, sila is important, but it is a sila that sits on understanding. If you're doing good for doing good's sake, if I'm just dana, dana for dana's sake, there is no wisdom. It didn't come, that sila didn't come after panya. Panya, wisdom, sila, morality, samadhi, the quiet mind. It has to follow a sequence. So if you are being kusala without understanding, it doesn't lead to Nibbana. It leads you to a very happy life, which is good. This is good enough. But if, you, if you're interested in the practice that leads to Nibbana, uh, then you have to do it by sequence. You have to understand, and then you do as necessary, and then the mind goes still, and then you see the mind as is. That's the sequence. But if all you have is just time to do one thing, then my advice to you is nail it on the sealer. Minimally, it helps you stay happy in daily life. If you say, I nail it on the panya, you can try. Your panya wouldn't go very far and you may not be very happy. You see, I was a graduate of Buddhist Pali University, a school that teaches the Ma. And I studied for many years. I studied many years, like nine. Because I went from one degree, uh, one diploma to another. And I can assure you, in all those nine, nine years, I wouldn't say I was happier than a regular person. I was not sadder than a regular person. I was just like that, just like that. Not, not, not very different. It's a lot of knowledge, a whole, whole chunk of it. But it really didn't make much difference in terms of happiness. But when, when I began to incorporate the Dhamma, Eightfold Path, into daily life, my sense of life is, really, it is very nice. Oh, life is very nice, so happy, so pleasant. And that's, and that's just the way it is. I'm not special. I'm just a good student. He, what he said, I follow. I'm a good student, okay? I just want to say the last point, explain a little, purify mind. At the first card, now, if you notice, the sequence always goes like this. Avoid evil, do good, purify mind, right? That sequence is always like this. 
The reason why it is like this is because this was an advice given to lay people. And the lay, the, the regular mind, leans towards akusala, unwholesome. I was telling some of them yesterday that our mind, if you're not careful, is parked in the akusala car park lot. It's parked there, ready to go. You know, it's ready. Put in the key and turn the ignition and that's it, we're gone. Why do I say that? You think about it. Is it so much easier to just lose your temper than to give meta? Or to be and to be uh, chaga and you know, generous? If you don't regularly force yourself to be chaga, chaga, tell yourself to be patient, patient. If you don't regularly do that, and you just let life roll, eh? let me, the, the, if you were to be like this, the odds are something will trigger and you will snap very quickly. You, you, you smell the food that you like and the greed arises, the one thing arises. It's so spontaneous and effortless. Try and stay mindful. Mindfulness is tough. Because our mind is regularly parked in the Akusala lot. It's just waiting for the right trigger to snap. So, the first thing we have to do is to try and steer the car from the Akusala lot to Akusala lot. Steer it there and keep it there. Don't steer it there and then move off two hours later. Keep it there. Keep it there for long enough and you will become a semi-permanent squatter on the Kusala lot. And then you will find that life is way happier. And what do I mean by Kusala? The easiest, dana, you know, generous, giving, being generous. Maybe not so easy for some people, but you try. Minimally, you can do this. Or time, or time, or energy. Or just sit around and help support a friend. That's all. It doesn't take a lot. Patience, humility, metta. Metta is friendliness. Huh? Karuna. All these are kusala mental states. Pick one that you find the easiest for you. And love it like a child, like a mother would love her only child. Literally grow that kusala mental state. Because that will be your biggest source of help when you want to calm that mind down. Kusala. If you are able to keep your mind on a kusala mental state, it's very easy to purify it. Purify means what? It's a little different from kusala. Purify means not allowing anything akusala to even be there, not even a stain. What does this mean? Let's say that, uh, think of it as the mildest form of wanting that can arise in you, the mildest preferences, the mildest form. Even that form is not there, not present. Can that happen? Yes, with practice. Can that happen tomorrow? I don't know. It all depends on how kusala you are already. But it can happen. Oh, but I'm a very agitated person, you know. Okay, that's fine. It'll take a bit longer, but you can get there. You can get to a state where the mind is way, way kusala and even not the stain arises. So, you will see the words, wipe the mind space clean to rise above ego and craving. The I, the source, the source point, rising above that and the habit 
to want something. Okay? I put Sati Samadhi together. Some people may say, aren't they different? They are different mental states. But they usually do come together if you got the meditation, the Dhamma, the Buddha's form of meditation correct. If you don't believe me, you can check out this sutta, Kaya Gata, Gati, Kaya Gata Sati Sutta, Majima Nikaya 119. You look, you go down to the back, it talks about the jhana. And you look at what are the mental states that arise in jhana. You will see that mindfulness appears from third, third jhana onwards. Where's Rex? Third jhana onwards. Actually, mindfulness is there. But by the third jhana, it is very clear. Your mind is very clear. It is right here in the now. Princeton. And it can recall. So what's the difference? What's the subtle difference between sati and samadhi? Sati keeps the mind focused on the now. Keeps it objective, keeps it clear, keeps it sharp. Make it able to gather, observe details. And remember the relevant essential details. It can spot and observe clearly. Samadhi is that stillness. I think some, some have translated samadhi as stillness, which is, in my view, more accurate with explanation of that state of mind. It's a state of mind that is quiet and present and still, meaning it doesn't drift. When you're in samadhi, it doesn't drift. And therefore, is that very different from sati? Sati is it's collecting data. When the sati is present, you can collect data. When samadhi is present and sati is not, which is very weird, but it can happen. Sati is not. There's stillness. It's so still, you just blank out type. Uh, that's not what we want. There's no wisdom there. You want to be present, clear in the mind, and able to see the activities of the mind, or no activities, and understand what that means. So samadhi, calm, peaceful, still, sustain. When the two comes together, that is when the mind has the capacity to I'm going to repeat the word, yata, buddha, niyatadasana. When sati, samadhi come together, mind is still enough, you can see the mind as is. Okay? Panya. All these mental states are not static, meaning they can grow. They can start from a rather weak, not so clear, a, a, a relatively milder level. I'm, I'm not even sure what's a good adjective for this. Not as strong. And then eventually it becomes very strong as a mental state. That is why in the 37 factors of enlightenment, you will see the Buddha using the same five mental states and use different words. Uh, indriya, the, the pancha indriyas, the five, the five faculties. And then the same five mental states, he calls it the five bala, power. So these mental states, they can become more powerful and then eventually they become factors of enlightenment. It's very powerful. It helps you to penetrate ignorance. So these are mental states that can start off as fledgling and blossom into superheroes to, to help you
clean up, abandon, eradicate ignorance, eradicate defilements. Okay? So Panya, at the, at the beginning state, relatively new, new point, Panya is... Panya is the, is the wisdom, it's the, it's the quality, the mental quality that enables you to understand conceptually what the teaching was about. Fundamentally, the noble truths and the Eightfold Path. When I say practice, it's the Eightfold Path. Conceptual understanding. The correct conceptual understanding. There can be wrong conceptual understanding. And it's Panya that helps you get it right. Okay? When you start your meditation, the Dhamma that the Buddha talked about begin to, the understanding begin to surface when you are in meditation. You're doing your meditation right. The understanding, the knowledge, the teaching will start to surface during meditation during reflection. If you can recognize this knowledge and you understand, oh, what he talked about, I am seeing it right now in meditation. That is correct correlation of teaching and seeing. Knowledge and insight, seeing. Okay. And in this particular step, what is most important is what the Buddha has always said, the wisdom to discern rising and falling. The wisdom to see the changing mental states in your mind. In, in quiet, when the mind is quiet, you look at it. Does it necessarily have to be in meditation? For most people, the mind is most quiet when they are in samadhi properly. Some, when they become very good at, having, at bringing up a quiet mind, then in daily life, they can experience dhamma correlation. They can discern rising and falling in daily life. But for most people who have never really practiced meditation, who have never really done samadhi properly, number one. Number two, they are generally agitated, angry people. So, you know, on the kusala, akusala balance, it's 90 10. 90 akusala, 10 trying to be kusala. So, when that happens, very unlikely that you will be able to discern rising and falling as is. Okay? Number three, we, we, I keep talking about operationalizing the Eightfold Path, right? Weaving it into daily life. Do you know how to? If you know how to, there's wisdom there. If you don't know how to, hmm, we need to polish up the wisdom. Clean it up a little. Because you need wisdom to keep you on track with right understanding, right thought, right, and, and so on and so forth. You need that wisdom to tell you, is this or is this not right understanding as I am doing this? Is this or is this not right speech? Is this or is this not right virya, effort, and so on? You okay? It is, not, it is not difficult, but it is not simple. It is not, oh, right understanding, four noble truth. Got it. Nail it. Nail it. If you had nailed it, you wouldn't be attending this talk. Because you're so happy at home. Bye. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you would be so happy at home. That's, that's all. You, you see what I'm saying? It's because you say, mm, I'm not sure about the teaching. I'm still not quite clear. I still need some help to, you know, calibrate the practice. Knowing that you need help to calibrate the practice in itself is wisdom. Then, when you know how to calibrate it for yourself at home, wisdom 
has grown. And the day that you say, I got it, this is fine. This is how it should be like. And if you're right, wisdom has truly matured for you. Get it? It shifts. Okay, it changes. Know what I'm doing? Making sure that the way you lead your life, the choices that you make, the, you are actually reshaping it according to the teaching. That your understanding is correct, that you are practicing correctly according to the teaching. Both requires wisdom. Okay? Finally, in meditation, you will have the arising of insights. It's normal. When the insights start to float and arise for you, you will form conclusions. Those conclusions, for them to be correct, consistent with the Dhamma, it also requires wisdom. Because it is possible, when your mind goes very quiet, you have certain experiences, and you declare, ah, this, this now is my soul. Ah, finish. Wrong conclusion. Inconsistent with the ma. Wisdom is incomplete. Worse, wisdom has taken a back seat. You know? It's just gone very funny ways. Okay? So I move on. Eh? I think I'm nearing the. I think, actually, why? I'm not sure why there are so many more pages. Okay, we we'll just do a quick one here. I'm going to show you how certain mental states are best friends. Okay? Sadda and Panya, they're very critical. We're going to have these two together. They reinforce each other. Both Sadda and all mental states need nurturing. In other words, you have to do certain things to help you strengthen, strengthen those mental states. So sadha needs strengthening. Panya needs strengthening. They are not static. Panya is not just knowledge. Panya is understanding concepts correctly. And this is just one part. It's the practice, knowing what you're doing is correct, knowing what you're seeing is correct. Yeah? Now, these states change and they are conditionally a reason, meaning you can perform certain activities, you can do certain things to strengthen these mental states. I mentioned earlier how sadda, faith, can be strengthened. I shall explain a little on how panya can be strengthened. Panya is strengthened as follows. You need four things to strengthen panya. You need to have a correct teacher guidance. You need to have correct teaching. Those are what I call the external, because Kapanya is about understanding and knowledge. Where do we gather our knowledge? Where do we gather your understanding? It's through an external source. If you have the right teacher, the, oh, no need teacher, guidance, the right guidance, the right text, the right readings. If you have the right external guidance, teaching, this is the right form, a person to do it, the teaching, that is correct. You put these two together, what you are taught, the knowledge you have gathered will help you, will help. The second part is internal. Now that you have the knowledge, but if you do nothing with it, nothing grows. It doesn't sink in, it doesn't form a part of your mental baseline. So you will have to practice according to the teaching. Practice according to the teaching and seeing correctly. So what you have been taught, if you begin to understand it, 
in daily life or in meditation, you begin to see the correlation between your life experience and what you understand, that is seen correctly. You have these four together, your wisdom will grow. If you don't have these, any of these missing, it's hard. It's harder. So, you have all the knowledge, all this information, but you didn't put into practice, are you, what are you growing? Imagination? If you have practice, I mean, you're trying very hard to walk the Eightfold Path your way, but you're not sure what he taught, what did the Buddha teach, if you don't have that understanding, what are you practicing? See the problem? And then your, your understanding of wisdom will grow as it grows, and we don't know if that's wisdom. So the four together, the four together, you'll be fine. You will, you will begin to understand. Okay. I said, wisdom gives insight and direction to faith. Without wisdom, faith is blind, easily misled, and shaky. This is a no-brainer, isn't it? This one, is, this one should be a no-brainer. In other words, wisdom keeps the faith anchored properly. But this one is not so obvious. You think that wisdom is good enough. But wisdom is not. I mean, basically, if you, if you have some understanding, if you have some understanding, and you could, you may well have all the right teaching, but your faith is lacking. Meaning to say, well, I have all this knowledge and I have all this understanding, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with it. Never mind, we we'll just park it aside. First, the faith is lacking. Then that wisdom will start to, it, it gets parked in the corner, it will develop dust, it will grow dust. Collect dust, uh, the root. It should grow, it should just collect. <laughs> Wrong verb. It will collect dust. But if you have faith and you tell yourself, you know why? Because faith is a mental energy that is light and happy. And faith will make you go back and sit and meditate and make you go back to the suttas. Faith is light. Faith is joyous. Sometimes with just faith alone, and you're just happy sitting there doing nothing. So faith, marry faith with wisdom, and it will grow. It will blossom happily. With faith, it strength, I said strengthens discipline. But some parts of the practice takes you out of your pleasure zone. But you have faith, then you will do it. Uh, let me share this. I'm not a morning person. I'm an owl. You know the expression, right? the luck and the owl. Morning, I'm the date owl. It's very painful. But some, some, some time ago, I realized for myself that I, I can meditate best when I have at least a good night's sleep and I'm really charged up. So I forced myself to wake up in the morning when, the bell, when, the, when my, my iPhone charm I will wake up, I will get out, I will just do it. Discipline. And it's really faith. It's faith that gets me going, get up, move, sit. And then we get started. You see what I'm saying? I, otherwise, the hour will say, half, half an hour more. I mean, why five minutes, right? Half an hour more. But no, just move, shoot, move. And then you move. Okay. The correlation between sila and samadhi. <coughs> Believe it or not, sila is a necessary condition for samadhi. Right sila, sorry, right samadhi will lead to a spontaneously wholesome state of mind. What do I mean? In order for you to be able to sit and get the mind, the word is right samadhi. Did I use the word? I didn't. 
the word is right samadhi. You can have wrong samadhi. You can just nail it on a spot and stay on that spot. And you're very disciplined, you just stay on that spot. And nothing happens. That is not right samadhi. Right samadhi is a state of being present here. And it stays quiet. The mind is peaceful. The mind is not thinking. The mind is present and being. In that state of mind, it's when you can reflect on the Dhamma. If your state of mind is in Samadhi, you are present, quiet. Isn't that peaceful? And if it's peaceful, you are very kusala. At that point, I can poke you and you will say, may you be well and happy. If your mind is spinning all over, I don't have to poke you. My shadow comes close to you. Eh, hey, that's my territory, huh? Back off. Eh? Okay, maybe you're not so aggressive. But the point is that in a state of mind that is quiet and present, and you're sitting there peacefully, that state is when you will experience Brahma Vihara, at least Metta and Karuna is, are present. At least these two will be there. And you'll be patient, and you'll be joyous, and you'll be very giving. And that is the time your son will come and ask you for money. And you will go, sure, may you be well and happy. <laughs> okay? Or maybe not. <laughs> it really depends on your practice. <laughs> Ah, I want to say this. Dhamma journey is three part. It requires Panya, Sila, Samadhi. In that sequence, Panya, Sila, Samadhi. It starts off with an understanding of what Dhamma is. <coughs> Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. If you don't know anything else about the Dhamma, it's okay. Honestly, it's okay. Four Noble Truth and Eightfold Path is the key. Why do I say that? Dhamma Chakka Pawatana Sutta, first sutta that the Buddha gave to the world. Hello, this is his first visit. The first time he's unveiling the Dhamma, would he not bring out the key essence? the most important part of the teaching. And actually, in that teaching, is the Ma. That's it. But humans being humans, regular minds being regular minds, we are really not very wise. So poor Buddha had to spend the rest of the 45 years coming out with all kinds, different ways of explaining the Dhamma. And then there came the proliferation of teaching. Actually, Four Noble Truth and Eightfold Path is it. It's good enough. There was a story, a cute little story, in the Dhammapada, where there's this monk who knows only one stanza, probably the Four Noble Truth and Eightfold Path. He knew only one stanza. And he realized he became an Arahan on that one stanza. That's it. So you don't need a PhD to become an Arhan. You don't. But you need to understand clearly, in every sense of the word, the Four Noble Truths, which actually is also the Eightfold Path. In every sense of the word. That, that stanza, that, that teaching got Kondanya into the stream is enough. Okay, so Panya is having the correct understanding of Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Paths. If you need more, then Panya includes understanding of the true nature of the mind, which is impermanent, dukkha, anatta. 
soullessness, substancelessness, essencelessness, it all depends on which one you want. It means there is no essential self, there is only condition arising. Only condition arising. So Panya is having this as the understanding in a conceptual way. When you first set up in Dhamma, that's all you have, conceptual, concept understanding. Sorry, conceptual understanding. Based on this conceptual understanding, you want to be a kusala person, wholesome, good person. So that the mind, when you meditate, the mind can go quiet, can go still, can go clear. And then in the stillness, with your conceptual understanding of the Dhamma behind you, in that stillness, it is possible to see the Dhamma as is in the mind. And then, if you can see that and you understand that correctly, you will feel a sense of being free because we are very burdened. You feel free. You feel liberated in very small ways, but you feel happy, you feel joyous about the understanding. That's the cycle. That's how it goes. And in daily life, for every, every bit of understanding that you glim of the Dhamma, for instance, I'm very upset. They didn't promote me. I'm really upset. And then you talk yourself into saying, it's okay, it's okay, I don't mind. If I were to be promoted, I would have no time for my son or daughter. Let's give gender equality, daughter. I have no time for my daughter. It's all right. And then, guess what? You feel better. You feel so much better. What is that? Magic? No. First, second, third, third, noble truths. And then you say, that's it? No, that's not it, but that's the good beginning. That is understanding the Dhamma in operation in daily life. And there will be many more of these little insights that come up. For instance, impermanent. When you set off trying to understand impermanent, is a concept. At some point, guess what? You got a cut deep enough for you to feel a lot of pain. Those little paper cuts don't count because you can fix it very fast. But it has to be, it has to be a, whether it's a physical, physical thing or an, a mental thing, it has to bite you deep enough for you to keep staring at it with such agitation. And then for whatever reason, you calm down and you're able to just look at the pain rather objectively. It is your blessing. You are able to look at it rather objectively. And you notice that, you know what? Pain intensifies and then eventually pain fades away. Ah, but it will come out again, but it will fade. You know, it, gets, it increases in intensity. It lightens in intensity. What is that? That is impermanent. And then for you, it may be this one moment go, oh, oh, this is impermanence. Oh, I, got, I, I got this. Am I, I'm enlightened. No, no, no. This is one baby step. These are the little, little baby steps that will wear away the stone in your mind, in your head. You need these little baby steps. And you need, and you need these little baby steps to arise in daily life. So, how do you incorporate the Eightfold Path in daily life? I'm not going to talk about Eightfold Path, I'm not going to talk about three because fundamentally it's three. Fundamentally is Panya, Sila, Samadhi. And I will show you how Panya being the Understanding and thought, right thought, 
how, how do you operationalize those? First, in daily life, you have to consolidate understanding and insight, which means you, there has to be some mindfulness of dukkha, origin, how, why, craving, the craving in your life, how, how the mind seeks and wants and chases and, and does all and thirsts. Remember the correlation between wanting and this is. You don't like the word suffering, neither do I. We will call it this is. Dukkha. The direct and immediate correlation between these two. You may say, but I know already, and I will say, you don't really do. Because if you do, you will learn that every time there is this one thing, you will then just wait for the one thing to settle down instead of feeding that one thing. You, you wait for it to settle. There's nothing wrong. It will come, it will surface, but it will fade away. Why? Because it's impermanent. Whatever happens will fade. You, you see what I'm saying? Change. It's a natural state of mind. If you're angry, don't act on it. Let be. It will fade. Oh, but mine didn't fade. Because you keep feeding it. You don't feed it with thoughts, it will fade. You feed it with thoughts, it will come back like a zombie. That's all. So, in daily life, how... When was the last time, before now, when was the last time you spare a thought for Dukkha and its cousins? When was the last time you spare a thought? If you say, oh, last week, same time. That's not good enough. Every time, surely that's not the only time you have agitation. Every time you have agitation, you ask yourself this, what is it I want? What is the one thing here? Every time you see agitation arising, you straight away ask yourself, what is it I want? What is the nature of the wanting right now that gives me this agitation? If you can answer that, you are living by the Dhamma. If you can't answer that, you are not mindful of the Four Noble Truths. You understand? Now, anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, dukkha, and substance. These are features. What is ultimate reality? These three. These are the only three ultimate reality. Everything else is subjective. Impermanent as a feature of the mind whether or not you believe in the Buddha, whether or not there is the Dhamma, that's a feature of a mind. There is no mind that stays still forever. Just like that. It can't. As soon as you are aware, you are off into next point. So the ultimate feature, the only thing that everyone shares and it is not a delusion, is impermanent. Right? The second ultimate reality, I said dukkha. And you say, oh, there are days when I'm not really dukkha. Those are the days you're not even mindful. The nature of the mind, the nature of a regular mind, is a certain degree of restlessness. Otherwise, we won't be so addicted to our devices. Because when you have nothing to do, you will do something. And the only reason why you are not very aware of this agitation in the mind is because you never let the mind really get there. As soon as the baby goes, milk. 
As soon as the mind goes, I want something. How to experience dukkha? Go on a retreat, we take away your iPhone. Ah, dukkha Arya Satcha. Noble truth of dukkha. It's okay. Seven days only. And then on your wall, you mark day one. <laughs> you see? So the regular mind, not, not letting it be involved with another object is dukkha. And in terms of object, there are only two types of object. That is why the Buddha say, Kama Tangha, Bawa Tangha. Right? Of course, there's a Wee Bawa Tangha, but Wee Bawa is Bawa Tangha sister. Bawa, we Bawa. Kama Tangha is your craving for an external object. Whether it's sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. Associating with someone you want to see, you want to hear, you want to touch. That's the external object. You look at your own habits. Isn't there some external objects that the mind regularly seeks, chases after? It does. The second object is an internal object. Mind made objects. Those are your bawa tangha. If you have got nothing to engage you from the outside, you will just go inside and create your own engagements, and create your own delights. <gasps> I had such a lovely steak. Uh, are you all vegetarian? I have such a lovely carrot today. It was a very nice carrot. It was orange, fresh. Internal object. The taste was long gone but I can still remember the smell of my mother's cooking. Yeah? And it's just the way we are. We were either engaged outwards or engaged inwards. And in this Bawa Tangha, there are many other forms. There can be the Bawa Tangha of things experienced, and ex uh, uh, sorry, of past experiences. And there can be the internal, the Bawa Tangha of, I wonder what they think of me. Should I be like this or should I be like that? Maybe I am like... So your mind wants yourself to look good, to be accepted, to, to think about people. The mind made activities. You know what I mean. And there's a full range of... Some of you will come up with a wider list. I'm, I'm not very creative. I can come up with name and ideas and views. They are all, all mind made. All mind made. All bawa tangha. Why Bauer? Because as soon as they arise, you live with them. You are living with them. You are, you are, they are in you. You are experiencing them. They are alive. You are with them. You get it? Your life is all about all these ideas and feelings and sensations generated from within. Untrained, untrained, not the teaching, not, not students of the, of the Buddha and the Dhamma. You don't even spare a thought, a, a thought for these habits. But the Buddha has brought it alive for you. They are like this. Knowing that they are like this and agreeing that they are like this, as he had described, then you ask yourself, continuing the way I am, how much can things change? in order for my reality to shift, to understand that, similar to the Buddha, I have to change, change the way I live, change the way I think, change the way I view life, etc., etc. You see what I'm saying? So, Anicca is a given, Dukkha, as you think about it, it's true, isn't it? Because no one here at all time is able to stop Tangha. At all time. No one here can do that. And as long as you can't 
stop this habit of chasing in outwards or chasing inwards and creating thoughts, as long as you can't stop this, at the point when it is happening, you are experiencing dukkha, whether or not you realize it. That's all. That's why he said, characteristics, ultimate reality, are Nietzsche, dukkha. Because your mind is always chasing out and chasing in. Right? And then some will say, ah yeah, but anatta, how, how do you explain that? Anatta has to be seen for yourself, for ourselves. But I can say this. In everything that we do, chances are you will start with this I, me, as the start point. Chances are. And the Buddha said, this start point is a problem because this start point is mind-made. Self is mind made. And then we go, I don't get it. I'm supposed to go really quiet, really still, and I will see that it's mind made. Yes, you will. If you, if you have not, the mind hasn't still enough. That is why, in the way that he taught, if you look at Anap. Anatta Lakana Sutta, the second sutta that he delivered to the, to the five ascetics who then, who then all became Arahan, that second sutta. In the second sutta, he talked about in what is, is five aggregates of grasping. Is it dukkha or sukha? They said, I'm oh, sorry, is it permanent or impermanent? And they said, impermanent bante. They said, okay. In something that is impermanent, Dukkha or Sukkha? They say, Dukkha Bante. In something that is Dukkha, is it fit to call it Atta or Anatta? Is it fit to call it Atta or Anatta? It's, just, it's not. It's, when he first taught it, he didn't say it like, you know, ultimate reality, Anicca Dukkha Anatta. He had it as this sequence. So, the third point says, if you see something as stuka, is it suitable to call it self? Start point. And they say, anatta bante. In subsequent teachings, he would tell his disciples this, the ones who have not realized, everything that you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, in everything, you tell yourself, this is not mine, I am not this, this is not my soul, this is not my atta. What does it mean? It's a training. You deprogram. You have to deprogram. Your habit is to say, I am real. He said, start off by saying, I am not. You do that often enough and you will realize at some point, this perception and assumption of I as real starts to change. Now, if it were real, how could it change? You see what I'm saying? You can say, permanent, this is permanent, this is permanent, this is permanent. Eh, nothing is going to change. It will stay impermanent. Say that. I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. I dare you to say I'm always happy. It won't happen. You will experience dukkha. But if you say anatta, anatta, if you say it often enough, deep meditation, do it correctly, walk this practice correctly, sorry, walk this path correctly, incorporate the practice correctly, at some point you will start to notice this notion of the I becomes more and more uncertain. As I said, if it were real, how could it change? How could it shade away? How could it flip? It can't. The fact that it can't flip means 
prior to this, there was a conditioning that led to a conclusion, and an assumption, and a baseline of reality. You see what I'm saying? Don't believe, put it into practice. What's that to lose? The only thing that you lose is unhappiness. It's a good exchange. You see what I'm saying? So, oh, there's one more. Ah, I should just lit it up. In daily life, you will experience, periodically you may have a, mindfulness, a mindful moment. At that point, observe how your mental state is at that point and what led to that mental state. Conditionality. Constantly reflect this. Noble truths, tilakana, three characteristics, conditionality. And that's all you do. This is how you will develop, cultivate wisdom. Okay? Good? Thanks. Now, um, earlier on, I spoke about sila, and I said, avoid evil, do good, and purify mind, right? Practitioner must have better standards. You should be wholesome. Don't let unwholesome arise. And what's wholesome? Patience giving, generosity, kindness, metta. Minimally, sorry, I, I'll just give it to you. Huh? Minimally, be generous, considerate, and patient. Loba, just minimal. Be empathetic. So I said, you need to hold a kusala line, meaning daily life, be kusala. Do not even get yourself to a state where you have to avoid a kusala. Be kusala, okay? Minimum. You learn to reduce, you learn to calm down and eradicate the akusala, the anger, the greed. You start to eradicate that you will find that you are a happier person. When you are a happier person, the kusala comes easier. It gets easier and easier. The one thing that can trip you while you're on this perfect the mind quest, the one thing that will trip you is ego. Big brother, big sister. This one will trip you. So what do you do? You tell yourself, what did the Buddha say? Not mine, no I, no self. Netang mamang, ne so hang asmi, not me so atta. Not mine, no I, no self. Not e so atta. This is not my atta. This is not myself, my soul. You actually remind yourself that. And some of you will, may say, some may say, oh, I tried that, it didn't work. Did you try that in isolation of everything else? If you only do not mind, not I, no self, if you do only that, but you never strengthen, consolidate your wisdom, remind yourself that things are impermanent, mental states come and mental states fade. These realities are mind-made. If you never keep telling yourself these things, you not mind, not I, no self, huh? it's just going to take you this far. Remember, three-part series, you have to consolidate the wisdom, hold the kusala line because of your wisdom, your understanding, and then this happens. This is easy. To sit regularly to help the mind stop chattering so much. You know, it was really quite cute. I conduct retreat. Uh, sorry, I've conducted two retreats. And in, I think, this year's retreat, um, 
I, I don't go for full silence retreat because everyone is very new. It's very painful for it to be complete silence. I go for no Sampa Palapa retreat. No gossiping, gossiping, chatting, chatting retreat. But you can, you can open your mouth and exchange the ma and talk a little bit. That's okay. At some point, one of them on their own, on her own, I think it was her, on her or his own said this. You know, after meditation, and then you come out and you go for breakfast and people start talking around you. It's very jarring, isn't it? And that's a personal realization of how much we talk and jabber, how noisy the mind is. But it takes a, a sitting for the person to realize that indeed it is true. There can be very talkative mind and there can be a mind that is quiet, and quiet is good. Less stimulation is actually very, very pleasant. So, my advice is set aside some time to let the mind quiet down. You don't have to, if you don't want to, or you don't have time, you don't have to sit for an hour. Well, should I sit for an hour if you want to? Must it be an hour? No need. What is great? Anything is good. It's better than nothing. Sometime. What is effective, very effective, is if you have a really quiet mind and you are very kusala throughout the day, but you are able to sit for at least 20 minutes. It can help. I just plucked the figure of like 15 sounds too little and half an hour maybe a bit long for 20 minutes. It's just it's a figure of the air. But it's the individual choice. Five minutes, a little short, don't you think? Ten minutes, mm, you're barely breathing. Well, Fifteen is at least, it's, it's decent. So you, you take a little bit of time. The, the idea is a little bit of time for the mind to rest without having too much talking. And the way to do it is to help the mind to put, to put the attention on a, mo on a quiet object. We use breathing. Breathing is an object. It's quiet enough. And if you like, after this, we can, I can show you how to do a little bit of breathing meditation. Okay? So you keep you keep consolidating these three mental states. The mental states of wisdom, the mental states of virtue, the mental states of the quiet mind, the quiet still mind. You keep consolidating this until these experiences start to arise for you. Rising, falling of mental states until I, I, the word nibidda, a verse, basically means that if you keep, you think about it, you think about it. If you're always experiencing for yourself change, pleasant, delightful change, painful uh, suffering, change. You keep experiencing this. Change, change, change. Rising, falling, rising, falling. At some point, you will say, oh, this is very tiring, isn't it? Somewhat fatigued. You know? Just tired of coming and going, rising and falling, rising and falling. Just asking you to think about it, imagine it. You can feel this. Can you feel this little sense of, oh, this is tiring. Life and life, life again and again. Assuming you are, you are Buddhist and you believe in rebirths, again and again and again, you come back, you go through education system. Then you finish the education system, you finish your education, now you've got to start working, earn money, build a family, live through this, die, start again. Die again, start again. Ad nauseum. Very tiring. Now imagine, this is just imagining birth and death. 
imagine that at all time you become very aware of change. The thing is, we're not very aware of rising falling. You may in a retreat and then you're very happy with yourself, but you just think about that. Just and and you know what? When you start to reflect on the Dhamma, you realize that happiness is also impermanent. And it's also conditioned. Pleasure is also conditioned. Then what's the meaning of life? Ah don't do that, huh? don't do that. Because you will start again. <laughs> don't do that. Which is the reason why in the time of the Buddha, if you read my book, you'll come across a chapter where we start talking about all kinds of crazy antiques by the monks, one of which is they killed themselves. They got so tired of watching the impermanence of the body, the, the, the ugliness of the body, they decided, I don't need this body. And Buddha came out of a retreat, like, uh, I think, I'm, I can't remember, two weeks, half a month, half a month or a month later, and went, oh, why are the numbers of, why, why has the numbers shrunk so much? Ananda said, oh, they killed themselves. It's, in, it's written in the Vinaya rules. So it's a real story. People were killing themselves in the time of the Buddha because of wrong practice. It's because they kept looking at, the, it, you see, the regular life, the regular man seeks beauty, attractive things. We look for that. In order to break the delusion, Buddha introduced the decaying corpse. Yes? Look at the lofsomeness of the body, the decaying corpse. So when you keep looking at something ugly and unpleasant, at some point you realize that this form that you slather with cream and you trim the nails and you pedicure and the manicure, and you, uh, this form becomes like that. And then, ah, oh, forget it, forget it. Let's just stack myself now. You know, that, it, it's a lopsided, it's not balanced anymore. So you have to restore the balance. And that was where he taught Meta to restore the balance in the mind. So the same thing here, you start looking at impermanence and the meaninglessness and you go on and on, at some point you go, oh my goodness. Oh, but then this, this doesn't happen very quickly. It, it, it takes a while more, long way off before one gets to this state. Impermanence has to be a part of life, very much a feature of your awareness. And then this, start to, this, is, this will start to happen. Don't stop. Continue the practice, Eightfold Path, continue. And then this part comes up. You become equanimous to change. And that's the idea. That whatever comes and go, you accept it as is. It's in the nature of every mental state to arise and fade away. It's in the nature of every experience to arise and fade away. This is nature. This is the Ma. This is nature. And the day that you begin to accept the nature, nature not out there, the nature in here, the day you accept the conditions that arise and change, it's the day you become less caught up, less trapped. Hence the expression, liberated. You feel better. You feel happier. When bad things happen, at the point when you accept that what happened has happened, you will feel calmer, right? Much calmer, much happier. You will just accept it, take the blow, and you leave. You ride it, isn't it? It's when you keep asking this question, why? Why does this happen to me? Why is this happening? I have never done anything wrong. Why is this happening? When you, when you question, it means you can't accept. And when you can't accept, very dukkha. So the training, the practice, is to get us to a state where we, we write, we accept, we understand the nature of the mind. We don't construct too many thoughts to feed the craving. We don't construct thoughts to feed the craving. We let be 
and we watch these arisings as they come and go. And if we can accept that, it's very peaceful. Life is far more peaceful. I, I use the word spontaneous letting go. If you are pushing a mental state away, a mental state away, if you're pushing it away, that's not letting go. That is still one thing. You must accept and let it be. Accept and let be. That's spontaneous. If you want to accept, that's not spontaneous. If you're patient and you allow whatever mental state to flip by itself, you will notice it's changing and it will stop at some point. Spontaneously. What if it doesn't? Mind made. Your mind making. Your mind making a worry. And worry in itself is also rising and fading away. Okay? Right here, I'm describing what is said in the Sutta about the Arahans. At the end, they are not holding on to the following. Eh? Sense delights, self, I, ego, views, thinking, creating, not holding on to anything. Whatever comes, it's there. If it fades away, it is in the nature to fade away. That's it. Okay? By and by, right conditions in place, when the mind has turned away from all delights, it no longer craves and clings, the mind experiences vimutti, liberation. That's Nibbana. Training the mind to accept, to let be, with understanding. Understanding that this is the nature of the mind, what comes will fade. It will come and it will go. Understanding it, so you accept it, you train the mind to accept. When the mind believes in you and it starts to let be, this is when you will feel happier, more peaceful, more kusala, very spontaneously. And then it all depends on the conditions of the mind. What will happen will happen. There is this cute little sutta. For the life of me, I cannot remember what sutta. Rex, help. I will tell the story first. And then if you remember, just shout out the sutta. The Buddha talked about the, the, the chicken and the egg thing, the hen and the egg. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, if you look at the sutta, it's a little different. I'm paraphrasing Buddha. He said, when the, egg, when the hen sits on the egg, the hen doesn't go, crack, hatch, hatch, quickly, hatch. The hen would just sit, when the conditions are right, the time is right, the temperature is right, it will hatch. Yes? The hen doesn't go, yo, quickly. In the same way, if you put the mental conditions in place, Nibbana will happen. There is no need for you to keep going. When is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? Am I doing it right? What should I be doing? You set in place five mental states. Put the five mental states in place. What are they? Sadda. Sila, Sati, Samadhi, Panya. Put these five mental states in place. The wisdom will grow. You will experience the change by itself. The mental conditions in place, you will experience the change. And you will know because Dukkha will diminish your sense of dukkha will diminish. There was a sutta where the Buddha said, asked his disciple, are there more dirt out there in the, forest, in the forest or under my nails? And the disciple said, oh, 
of course, under your nail, less dirt in the forest, more. And he said, the experience of dukkha, the experience of dukkha of the untrained puttujana is comparable to the amount of dirt on the forest floor. But he who has entered the stream, his experience of dukkha is comparable to that under my fingernails. Fingernails. So one of the indicator that you will know for yourself is that you are on the right track in this practice is the experience of dukkha should start to diminish. If you find that you, you, if you believe that you have been doing your meditation and you have been following this, that and other, but, you know, I don't feel any real change. I still feel very stressed. I still feel very pain. I still feel all the burdens of life. Something is off there. The practice is not correct. It's, you're, not, you're not calibrating the mind correctly. Practice is not properly done. Okay, so you know for yourself from the experience of the dukkha, your experience of dukkha. It is not things out there getting better. It is things in here getting better. You're more accepting. The moment you're more accepting, your sense of dukkha diminishes. Hence, the expression in uh, Mangala Sutta, the last stanza, the second, the, the last two stanza. When a person has understood the Dhamma properly, he's unshakable. Whatever happens out there, happens out there. It does not, they don't shake his mind. Why? Because he's give, he has let go of wanting, preferencing, craving, chasing. He, he's, he has let that settle. So nothing affects him. Okay? Sadhu. 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 Sadhu.